Good afternoon, everyone. We had a great morning, and now we head into the final session. Excited to be part of it. I'm Joelle Fishman. I'm here in New Haven, Connecticut, along with uh, Walid Ahmed, who is helping me with the PowerPoint, and in Iowa. Joe Henry here in Iowa. Good to be here. Great. So um, you can see from the uh, slide that's up already, uh, the theme we were asked to prepare on winning against the threat of fascism today will be presented in three parts. I'm going to start uh, with uh, fascism, unity, and resistance, and basically a, a kind of overview uh, frameworking. And then um, pass it over to Joe Henry, uh, the key struggle today, voting rights. And then when that's completed, we'll have time for questions and discussion. So I hope it's a useful, um, a useful event. And we're ready now for the next slide. So um, it was just two years ago in the spring of 2020 that we in the Communist Party rolled up our sleeves and went to work with the Dump Trump voter pledge cards and the Vote Against Fascism campaign to uphold democratic rights and the ongoing freedom struggle for people, peace, and planet before profits. It took a huge united effort many of us were part of, led by labor and civil rights, to defeat Trump at the polls. At that time, a lot of folks didn't fully see the fascist danger underway. But we sounded the alarm based on our historical experience and our Marxist working class analysis. Then, in January 2021, when the Trumpites and white supremacist elements stage a coup attempt on the Capitol, trying to overturn the results of the presidential election, a lot more people, even in corporate media, began to take a second look and understand the depth of the peril in our country. The draft opinion to overturn abortion rights by the US Supreme Court, uh, stacked with three Trump appointees, is a further alarm. And today's rallies uh, bans off our bodies across the country for women's health and abortion rights, and the solidarity some whole states like California and Connecticut and others are showing are just the beginning. To successfully resist fascism, we have to understand it. So what is fascism? The working class struggle definition emerged out of the horror of the fight against fascism in World War II. Building upon Lenin, it was described by Bulgarian communist Georgi Dimitrov as the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements of finance capital. Today, we're talking about the financial, military, and energy sectors of capital seizing more and more wealth and power in the midst of impoverishment of the people. The fascist danger emerges within the continued intensification of the crisis of capitalism worldwide. Fascism's goal is maintaining complete control over the working class and people for maximum profits and global domination. So fascism and democratic rights are like oil and water. They don't mix and they can't coexist. Fascism would dismantle democratic structures, shut down and eliminate the ability to have a voice, to assemble, to organize or protest. Fascism relies on sowing hatred, fear and division among the majority in order to create a mass base that accepts the role of the dictatorial few. Obstruction and sabotage of normal government functioning is a fascist tactic. Blocking nominees was used as part of the economic sabotage campaign that overthrew the socialist popular unity government in Chile in 1973, for example. Republican leaders in the <laughs> US Senate 
House and state houses increasingly show a fascist-like contempt for truth, democratic process, or the national interest. They'll do anything to gain power. Consider, for example, the notorious Koch brothers, whose financial empire emanates from exploitation of oil and gas. They have been ultra-right provocateurs on behalf of the capitalist ruling class for decades, utilizing a web of think tanks and funding vehicles to influence state and federal legislation. Charles Koch is a preeminent funder of outright voter suppression legislation in 43 states. The Koch money trail leads to the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6, 2021. And the senators they fund are sabotaging the Build Back Better massive investment in social infrastructure so desperately needed post-pandemic that would create 2.3 million jobs every year for the first five years in childcare, healthcare, education, and climate change mitigation. Programs, by the way, that have wide majority support in the country. These most reactionary, chauvinistic, and imperialist elements of finance capital are aided and abetted by more mainstream capitalists. For example, while Koch Industries funds ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, to push anti-worker bills on state legislatures, other elements of capital have given support, while at times trying to maintain their distance. The secretaries of state who oversee elections and certify the vote have come under extreme pressure and attack in the states where Trump sought to overturn the vote results. Executive director of the state's project issues this grave warning, quote, what's happening in these states is the single greatest threat to our democracy since the Civil War era, end quote. Trump's America First Secretary of State Coalition, he calls it SOS, it's an SOS for us, includes candidates for Secretary of State this year who are all election deniers with the goal of having them in place in time to control the presidential election results in 2024. The Attorney General in Michigan, considered ground zero, said, quote, this is a choice between whether or not we'll have a democracy moving forward. The seeds of fascism are present in the rising white supremacist attacks, fake news, attempts to take over local boards of ed to block public schools from teaching black history as integral to US history, attempts to dismantle the rights of immigrants, indigenous peoples, the LGBTQ plus community, continued police killings of black and Latino youth, attempts to deny science, outlaw abortion rights, overturn union rights, forbid discussion of socialist ideas, and most of all, to undermine and override voting rights through gerrymandering and overturning election results. Fascism preys on people who are hurting in the capitalist system, using lies to whip up hysteria and racist ideology to misplace the blame on those who are different than themselves. The fight to prevent fascism is by definition a fight for the hearts and minds of the whole multiracial, multinational working class and people to maintain and expand the democratic right to a voice in the first place, protection and expansion of voting rights and to embrace social solidarity. One powerful example is the role of the Unite Here Union working alongside Stacey Abrams in Georgia for the US Senate runoff in January, 2021 that resulted in a 50-50 Senate. Despite the pandemic, they found a safe way to knock on thousands of doors in all parts of the state and have frank conversations about the concerns of that family and what was at stake with right-wing Republican control of the US Senate. In other words, 
showing that every vote makes a difference and that change is possible when working class people see their common interests against the 1% and stick together to fight for their rights and needs. A canvasser from New Haven who went down and volunteered told the story of knocking on doors in far-flung rural areas and being met with a shotgun at more than one door, actually, only to win the support of that family by the end of the conversation. The seeds of a mass democratic resistance movement are emerging out of the fight back against racial and economic inequalities exposed in the pandemic and the seizure of vast wealth by giant corporations and billionaires while the majority is literally struggling to survive, especially essential workers of whom many are women of color. The seeds of a mass democratic resistance movement are emerging out of the Black Lives Matter demands and marches for police accountability and end to murders of black youth. The seeds of mass democratic resistance movement are emerging out of the uprising of young workers at Amazon, Starbucks, and many other places sweeping the country for a living wage, respect, a voice at work, and the chance to build their lives. The seeds of a mass democratic resistance movement are present in the youth-led organizing, taking on fossil fuel profiteers and the military industrial complex to address systemic climate change and the future of our planet. To be strong enough and large enough to successfully resist the drive toward fascism, Dimitrov and the communist movement argued that the lessons from Hitler fascism's rise to power show the need for broad unity, what we call today the All Peoples United Front that includes the multiracial working class, along with democratic-minded forces from all social strata. We communists are an important part of building that broad united front, which by definition includes those with whom we may disagree on some other issues. For instance, some Democrats who support the struggle for voting rights, racial equity, and build back better, in contradiction, go along with an imperialist foreign policy. In reality, bipartisan support for Cold War policies adds to the crisis and heightens the fascist danger. The fight for peace objectively strengthens resistance to fascism. With strategy and tactics in mind, contradictions in thinking can be overcome. For example, by emphasizing the danger of nuclear war, and the devastation caused by a war economy that decimates the budget for human needs and accelerates climate change. The recent return of Cold War rhetoric and anti-communism presents a new challenge, which objectively weakens broad people's unity and endangers the efforts in 2022 to vote against fascism. What's the response? The best response is to step up our grassroots organizing for immediate needs of the people so they know the role of communists and participation in issue coalitions and expanding readership of people's world for a broader world view. One great example is the workers at Amazon in Staten Island being introduced to and guided by CPUSA a leader, William Z. Foster's writing on organizing in the steel industry from the last century. The fight for democracy and broad unity to resist fascism is not separate from our socialist vision. It is a vital part of the road to get there. Organizing to preserve democratic rights and voting rights and reject bigotry opens the door to engage with neighbors and coworkers and friends in the larger daily struggle to qualitatively expand those rights beyond capitalism. The seeds of socialism are present in the uprisings underway, which are objectively taking on the contradictions of capitalism and its interwoven systemic racism, exploitation, and imperial strive toward war. These struggles are connected 
to the movement for socialism because a growing number of people, especially youth, realize that capitalism is responsible for all the inequalities they experience. Our program calls for Bill of Rights Socialism. We want to qualitatively expand democratic rights for all components of the multiracial working class and people. Our goal is to contribute toward building a massive movement that wins control of its own destiny. As, Jarvis, as Comrade Jarvis Tyner said, quote, the very fight for democracy is a radicalizing struggle that has and will transform the capitalist system. In practical terms, what are we called upon to do today? As the saying goes, organize, organize, organize. A strong communist party and YCL is an integral part of the broad all people's front. We bring our ability and commitment to raise class consciousness so people can see their place in the struggle. As communists, we understand that building the union movement and the fight against racism raises up all other struggles. The experiences building workers' power at Amazon and many other workplaces are at the heart of also building our party among the working class. We find that people are looking for and welcoming our contribution. As well, local struggles in multiracial working class communities provide the opportunity to build unity and grow. And I'll give an example from where I live in New Haven, uh, the largely African-American New Hallville neighborhood, uh, where community leaders, including the Communist Party Club, organized a mass protest against development that would have had a negative impact. Door knocking on issues and voter registration over the last few years had brought the ward from one of the lowest to one of the highest voter turnouts in the city. As a result, the neighborhood won citywide support across all lines to block the development in their neighborhood. The People's World door-to-door -door distribution is a part of this unfolding fight back. Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania, where Denise Edwards has just been elected president of the Borough Council by acclamation, is being held up throughout that region as an example of fighting in a unified way to successfully address police brutality and the housing crisis. The Mass Poor People's and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Morrow March on Washington and to the polls on June 18 and the call for a third reconstruction bring all these struggles together. Participation in this action and the large Communist Party contingent promises to build solidarity and unity going forward. This march is geared to jumpstart an all-out mobilization for 2022 midterm elections. As Trump tours the country, spewing his poison, and corporate dark money flows into fascist-minded Republican campaigns, the need to speak frankly with millions of people door to door is paramount. While the media drumbeat is that Republicans will carry the 2022 election, the story on the ground may be different. For example, in Wisconsin's spring school board and local elections, a diverse coalition helped elect a number of progressive candidates of color, defeating divisive right wing Republicans. Elections at every level are crucial to the future of all democratic rights. The 2022 election is connected to day-to-day -day organizing on the ground for a just recovery for all from the pandemic. The principles for an emergency relief unity program our party issued last year provides a foundation for building unity around the immediate needs working class families face. The program framework says, we stand on the principles that employment, housing, healthcare, education, energy, and freedom from racism and discrimination are basic human rights for all, regardless of country of origin. The extreme right wing mantra being touted in the 2022 elections 
for austerity in a time of inflation is inhumane. As the Economic Policy Institute said in a recent report, quote, the rise in inflation has been driven by higher corporate profit margins and supply chain bottlenecks, end quote. The best response is to fully fund job creating human needs and climate sustainability by taxing the billionaires and shifting funds away from military spending. Out of these struggles for the common good, candidates can emerge who are diverse working class champions. The 2022 elections are a critical moment in the resistance against fascism. At last month's National Committee meeting, Joe Sims called for a collective unity of action by our party, and it's such a great quote, I would like to share it. He said, this collective unity of action is stitched together in voter registration drives, fundraising initiatives, rallies, occupations, door knocking, picket lines, phone banking, and get out the vote efforts. It's woven in the process of contacting neighborhood associations, PTAs, lodges, women's rights groups, and environmental organizations, along with reaching out at grocery stores, bars, pool halls, barbershops, beauty salons, dry cleaners, and county fairs. And it's sewn into an unbreakable thread by demonstrating, sitting in, writing letters to the editor, outlining the issues and supporting candidates who back them, including, when possible, our own party candidates, end quote. Every new voter registered is someone who can become involved in ongoing organizing and collective action on their own behalf. It's no wonder that taking away voting rights is at the heart of the fascist right-wing agenda. To summarize, the key components of our strategy to win against the threat of fascism include building a broad people's front of all class and social forces committed to preserve and expand democratic rights, raising working class consciousness to build unity and action against racism, hate, bigotry, lies, fear, and division, participating with labor organizing and civil rights and peace movement organizing, working with labor and other allies at the door-to-door -door level to register new voters and get out every vote on the basis of issues and ongoing collective action for basic needs, building a bigger and stronger communist party, YCL and people's world, rooted in multiracial working class communities, workplaces and campuses to mobilize for emergency relief and offer a longer term vision of socialism. Our extraordinary comrade Art Perlow understood how to engage coworkers and neighbors in action and raise class consciousness. We carry his legacy forward in the mobilization to vote against fascism and in the inspiring growth of the Communist Party. Now, in part two, Joe Henry will delve into the key democratic struggle for voting rights, followed by part three questions and discussions. Thanks. Joe, the floor is yours. Joe, open your mic, please. Okay, yeah. here we go. Mm -hmm. So we are going to go into the PowerPoint. I'm going to start it. Okay, so yeah, thank you. So here we are. We are having to look now at the mechanics of the right to vote and what we're having to deal with right now with voter suppression. Okay, so what are what are we dealing with right now? After about 50 years of expanding the right to vote, we are now having to fight back and deal with voter suppression, in particular such things as voter ID. Why is this? You know, voter suppression is basically the playbook on fascism. Uh, this is how the Republicans are moving forward, using fascist tactics in the form of voter ID. How do they do it? Reduce the size and influence of the country's non-white population. That's what they're attempting to do. 
advocate voting restrictions to make it easier for Republicans to win. It's also part of a new nativist movement that is rap rapidly gaining influence, not just in the United States, but across uh, the kind of across the world. So there is a there is a chilling narrative that is used in promoting uh, voter ID, voter suppression, uh, using terminology that you know historically fascists would use uh, uh, in Hitler's Germany, deceitful foreigners subver subverting democracy, or things are used to to narrow the ability to vote, making people believe that voter fraud is rampant. Uh, claims of illegal voting, marginalizing uh, different groups, minority groups, social groups, um, taking the discussing the changing demographics of the United States, uh, and then this false narrative about a culture war between Anglo-Protestants and the newer immigrant groups, uh, Muslims, so forth and so on. So the big lie again promoted through fascism through these fascist tactics uh, on voter suppression, uh, discussing, stating things about a large and continuing influx of Hispanics threatening the preeminence of white Anglo-Protestant culture, uh, placing English as the only national language, their promotion, so forth and so on. So one of the big things that has happened in the recent years, again, after 50 years of expanding the right to vote through struggle, the party played an important role up through into the 1960s. We have a Supreme Court decision, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 2013, in June of 2013, in a, a case called Shelby County versus Holder. The Supreme Court basically dismantled the Voting Rights Act. Uh, it was a terrible thing. It removed the protections of the Voting Rights Act, especially as it pertained to Southern states and there was a protection element called pre-clearance uh, in which when states attempted to implement new voting rules in their states, uh, particularly in the South, it would have to be reviewed by the Justice Department. Uh, and that no longer exists. The Supreme Court stated that racism no longer exists in, in the US, therefore pre-clearance is no longer needed. Um, Justice Ruth, Bader Ginsburg made a famous statement that throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work just to stop discriminatory change is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. So here we are again after 2013, a massive amount of, of uh, voter ID laws have been uh, put forth and implemented. Uh, 23 states created new obstacles to voting right after 2013. Um, more information here on what has happened since 2013. Voter ID laws again, 36 states have identified, have identification requirements at the polls, seven states have strict voter IDs, so forth and so on. Over 21 million U.S. citizens do not have qualifying government issued photo identifications and are disproportionately voters of color. These voter ID laws, as we're all familiar, again, have made it much more difficult to younger groups. And here the evidence states why it is not necessary to have voter ID laws. Again, it's a smokescreen by the conservatives, by the Republicans to use this to restrict the vote to only promote the white voting population. Again, who's affected by, by voter suppression? Um, short answer is all of us. Our democracy is debased when, vote, when the vote is not accessible for all. And that, again, it affects people of color. One in 16 black Americans cannot vote due to disenfranchisement laws. Counties with large minority populations have fewer polling sites than poll workers per voter. In 2018, Latinos and Black Americans were twice as likely as whites to be unable to get off to get off work uh, while polls were open on election day. 25% of voting age Black Americans do not have government-issued voting IDs, so forth and so on. 
In 2016, we heard after Trump was elected, um, stating that the reason he did not win the popular vote was he stated, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. The false narrative that he and his cronies promoted, which again is a form of fascism. And again, in 2020, uh, Trump stated massive election voter fraud in the 2020 election. Again, the false narrative part of fascism. Um, 2018 found election officials it closed thousands of polling locations, which going back to that period of time, began again the restriction on the right to vote, closing of polling locations, impact all over the country, its impact on people of color. Voter registration res restrictions, restricting the term and requirements of registration is one of the most common forms of voter suppression. Restrictions include requiring documents to prove citizenship identification, onerous obstacles for voter registration, limiting the window of time in which to vote. And again, we had said before over 37 states after 2013 Supreme Court decision uh, moved towards having these type of requirements. Kansas being one of them where they had actually required voters to show a birth certificate or a copy of birth certificate. What was interesting is that in 2018, there was a mass mobilization of voters, even in the midst of voter ID, voter suppression. Uh, the movement was just historical, which led up to 2020 and the election of President Biden. But again, we have been hit hard with the criminali criminalization of the ballot box. Some states are discouraging voter participation by imposing arbitrary requirements, harsh penalties on voters, poll workers, uh, who violate the rules. Georgia, lawmakers have made it a crime to provide food and water to voters standing in line at the polls. Lines that are notorious, notoriously long in Georgia, especially for communities of color. In Texas, people have been arrested and given outrageous sentences for what amount at most innocent mistakes made during the voting process. Because of racism in law enforcement and the broader criminal legal system, criminalization of the ballot box disproportionately impacts people of color who are more likely to be penalized. Methods of voter suppression aims to instill fear in communities of color, suppress their voices in the democratic process. Voting purchase, uh, another element that has happened uh, in the last several years uh, under the auspices of cleaning up the voter rolls, basically taking people off the voting rolls if they miss an election. Redistricting, gerrymandering, another form, we've, we've heard a lot about this in the news, especially down in Texas and in Florida, where redistrict, redistricting and gerrymandering in areas, even though are predominantly people of color, have been made in such a way by Republicans to make it difficult to get somebody elected who is a Democratic Party candidate. How do we protect our right to vote? We, we have to mobilize. We have to promote uh, progressive legislation across the country. Uh, here we have different uh, laws that have uh, gone into place and promotion. We won't go into it here because we have limited amount of time. Where do we start? Here is the basic thing. And, and this was stated uh, in, in the People's World uh, in the party uh, documents that Joe Sims uh, had stated. Collective unity of action with neighborhood groups, PTAs, lodges, women's rights groups, environmental organizations, doing voter registration at grocery stores, bars, pool halls, barbershops, beauty salons, dry cleaners, county fairs, joining a massive voter registration campaign, League of Women Voters, NAACP, Stacey Abrams groups, Fair Fight in the New Georgia Project Action Fund, Common Cause, League, uh, League of United Latin American Citizens um, participating in these registration drives, not in not just in your states, but in, in other states, focusing on voter suppression states to overcome the foes with the numbers. If you can't can canvassing, if you can't canvass in person in many states, voter suppression or not, you can't unless you live there. But the best, but not the only instrument is the telephone. Uh, you can call you can call people in other states. Um, on behalf of campaigns to reach out to them. Uh, texting is, is another uh, really new type of 
technique, technology that can be used uh, across the country when you participate with different groups who do texting campaigns. Uh, join pro-voting campaigns. Um, make sure it has an educational component, teaching voters how to remain legally registered. Uh, work with groups, progressive groups, lawyers, so forth and so on, uh, who are part of these. Volunteer to be election judges, poll workers. Uh, uh, purchase a voter file in your area. Go to a county election office. We can show you how to do that. Uh, learn how to to find out who in your neighborhood is registered to vote or who isn't. Knock on doors, walk out your front door, get on the sidewalk, go to your neighbor's house. Uh, work on a local level again, work and mobilize progressive candidates. School boards are so important right now to participate in those elections, city councils, county election officials, secretary of state candidates, poll workers. The grassroots matters and it can be more effective for our activists. All those things are important for us to do. So that kind of wraps it up uh, on what I was wanting to convey, but for my part, it's where the rubber meets the road. It's for us to do real things out there in the community, in the workplace, uh, right outside our workplaces, talking with workers, helping them understand how their voice is through their vote and how the fight for democracy is with voting, how the 2022 election will determine the framework in which the 2024 presidential election will be held. The more we engage now will make it much more successful for us in 2024. But we must begin now. We must do practical work. We must mobilize. So uh, thank you, Joelle. Okay, well, I guess then the two of us can uh, ask Dee. Um, do, you to, do you want to take, how do you want to proceed? Do you want to take, um, say, 15 minutes of questions and comments and then turn it back to you all? Or what do you want? Okay, yeah, we'll take your advice. That sounds okay. good. All right, so the floor will is, uh, uh, is open for discussion if you'd like to speak. Uh, one, open the mic on your end just by using your mouse cursor and click the picture of the mouse on your control panel. And two, uh, click the uh, picture of the hand to indicate you want to int introduce a question or a comment. So looking for hands. Yeah. No, it's fine. Okay. Giles, your mic is open. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. I'm sorry about the last lesson. I got a little emotional when it hit close to home. Perfectly uh, not. fine. Anyway, could you put here's what I want to say. Slide. Right Please. now. Other slide. Hello. Hello? Uh, Joel, we can hear you. Go on, Giles. <clears throat> Good. Yeah. Right now, we are in a time where people are questioning capitalism. We have to strike while the iron is hot. Like even if we don't win elections, keep on doing the message. I mean, research has shown that when you keep repeating things over and over again, it's gonna get stuck into people's heads. But right now, we have the greatest advantage in controlling the message. Besides just showing science and stuff, I don't see a lot of science to show like information on websites where they get information so people could take the opportunity to educate themselves. And another thing is, I don't see video projections in protests as well. So if you have portable projectors and a good volume equipment, you could also showcase that to people as well. Now is the time to, to, to go strong with the message. Win or lose, keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Looking for raised hands. Excuse uh, me, Dee. Uh-huh. We are trying to get the cover slide up that has what the session is. Okay, okay, just a minute. So that's Waleed? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There you are, you should be able to now. Got it? Yep. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Looking for raised hands, Ben? Your mic is open on up. Yep, 
Come on. Speak up, please, Ben. Okay, we can't hear you. Your mic is fully open, but we can't thank hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to ask about the dichotomy between telling people the importance of voting um, and understanding the material realities of of what the landscape looks like, particularly if you know particularly ugly forces take power, when the reality is that the Democrats are almost as much of an enemy of communists and, and leftists uh, as fascists are and are weak and ineffectual. Like, how do you, how do you, you know, mitigate that and talk to people about both the importance of, you know, true leftist ideas and to once again throw their vote away on people who won't help them, don't care about them, and who are largely enemies of our own political struggle? Thank you. Uh, I can jump in something where, you know, the part, um, the history of voting is very important. The history of the party is very important. I mean, the thing that we have available to us is, as a party is that we can give the historical perspective of the struggle for um, for different groups, uh, especially the struggle for the right to vote amongst uh, people of color in this country and how we played a part on that going back 100 years. It's always been about voting. It's always been about the power of the vote, the right to vote. Uh, civil, you know, the uh, civil war, uh, the right of black people to vote, the right of women to vote. All those struggles were important. We've been here before. We were here a hundred years ago. We were here even before that. But the party has been effective in joining with workers, uh, both uh, at their workplaces and in their communities to fight for their rights. And history has shown us, and we have been there as a party. It has shown us that it always had to do with voting. Voting was always the way to do it. And to fight fascism has to do with fighting for democracy. And also, it's not just for uh, public elections. It's also for the right to vote for a union in, at your shop. All those things, it's a powerful, powerful thing. But it is discounted in the current culture, and we must educate um, our fellow uh, workers about how important that is. Joel, do you get you want to respond? Oh well, maybe I could just add um, on to what you said, Joe. Is um, you know, voting is part of the democratic struggle. It's also part of the class struggle, and the democratic struggle and the class struggle are really interwoven with each other. But the approach to voting uh, or talking to people about why they should register when they're alienated is that um, in unity is strength. We're, it's an organizing task that we're doing. We're not going out and um, focusing on this or that candidate. We're going out to say that we can make change, but if we stay separate in our houses and unengaged, then we will be rolled out, we will continue to be rolled over. But if we come out and join together and stay together year round on, on issues of need, whether it's jobs or housing or, or whatever it may be, that's our power as the working class and the people. So I think that if you start, if the starting point of elections is from a different vantage point. I think when um, in the earlier class, I think it was D, but um, the idea of an individual approach versus a collective approach. And so in general in society, you know, um, good government go out and cast your vote as an individual. But as communists, we look at it a little differently. And we're looking at how we build worker power, how we build it up together. And frankly, in uh, some parts, in some places, we have elected champions of the working class. Well, I just referred to Denise Edwards there. Uh, she's been serving in the uh, borough council there in Wilkinsburg for quite a few years, but uh, she just got 
uh, uh, by acclamation to be the uh, chair of that. There's there's other examples, uh, and especially some of our comrades and close friends who are in the labor movement, because the labor movement now has a big campaign to try and get um, uh, union um, uh, worker organizers uh, elected to public office to come with a different viewpoint. And we know that when you're struggling, it's not enough to just be on the ground. You must be on the ground. But if you have something you can relate with that's inside, then you can do much more to, to get uh, relief for people and to show that in collective action, it's possible to win victories. We have to celebrate every partial victory that we win, not only because it, um, it uh, is an immediate relief for people at the moment, but because it shows how we can win much bigger all the way to socialism. Thank you. Kay is one of our young Marxists, and he, ha I'm sorry, and they have spent a little time developing a contribution to this class. Open your mic, please. Hello. <clears throat> Pardon me. Am I audible? Yes. Excellent. So I'm pleased to say that I'll be repeating a lot of points that have already been uh, shared. Uh, uh, the, remar the remarks I prepared are uh, uh, touch on dialectics, uh, specifically on contradiction, but uh, this is really relevant to uh, the struggle to prevent the rise of fascism here in the United States uh, in this current moment. Um, so in the context of Marxist philosophy, addressing the concept and reality of contradiction is centrally important. Uh, Lenin wrote in his On the Question of Dialectics that the splitting of a single whole and the cognition of its contradictory parts is the essence of dialectics. So the quickest example I could give you uh, would be class society itself, where um, we can turn to Marx's uh, German ideology uh, we have a quote that says, there are contradictions between the forces of production and the social relations of production, different sides of which can be in different nations. So for example, uh, we have plenty of technology that's able to uh, feed the world, and yet the social relations of production, which would be uh, capitalism, uh, doesn't allow um, everyone to be fed. Uh, so a bit more specifically, uh, we can look at uh, the contradiction between uh, the proletariat and wealth. Those are opposites, but they come from a single whole that are, uh, they're both created by uh, existing in this world of private property. But wealth is created by the capitalist organizing for the proletariat to produce it. Um, and one can't exist without the other. Um, on top of that, uh, we see that as the contradiction between the working class and the capitalist class becomes sharper, opportunities for each class to raise its own consciousness and self-organize in its own interest increase. So since the beginning of capitalism, this has led to the creation of new tools uh, for each class to apply pressure to the other. So on one hand, you have the vanguard party of the working class, which uh, we hear in the Communist Party, um, strive to be and on the other you have something of a conglomeration of violently reactionary fascist organs of the capitalist class um, and right now the republican party seems to be quite possessed um, by a lot of these um, organs so with this in mind uh, how do we concretely struggle against fascism uh, it turns out that uh, what joe and joel have been saying here is really key uh, another illustration of contradiction is the one between the bourgeois claiming to uphold democracy and having to prevent it or allow it to deteriorate or even in some sections uh, campaign to reverse it. So it turns out that the term reactionary is key here. 
I was talking with a comrade a couple weeks ago about you know how ridiculous this world situation is if you like zoom out a bit and think about the whole thing. I said something like, you know, this political situation is just unhinged. It's like the progressive forces are the only ones pushing for like consistent solutions to the problems we face today. Um, and the communists or our close allies are the only ones who really have a long-term program at that. Um, so and I said something like, you know, the people have a habit of calling politicians hypocrites for saying one thing and doing another, um, whether it be the Democrats or the Republicans. And we've seen that both over the past few years. Uh, but this hypocrisy can be seen as contradiction in action. Um, the inconsistency and contradictions within fascism are necessary. Uh, and this is their primary strength and the source of their primary weakness. It's a strength because the unity of the working class that we communists seek to build and fascists seek to destroy can only be destroyed by decimating the working class and its organizations and in unifying so-called the pieces on an illogical basis. So at the same time, it's a weakness because of this illogical basis. So every actual incongruence that's papered over by the capitalists and would-be fascists is an opportunity for us communists to wedge apart their actions and their ideology. So that's why um, communicating and acting with the Marxist approach is so important. So this current reaction of the reactionaries, that is the anti-working class right wing, is ultimately uh, at its source due to the working class's use of whatever political power we've seized under bourgeois democracy through the democratic struggle or through the class struggle in any of its manifestations. And so this contradiction among the capitalists between upholding democracy and allowing for its reversal is not lost on us as a class. Um, and it can't be really with the speed with which these things are brought to light in different areas. So the clear course of action from here is to go deep into all democratic institutions we participate in and organize and mobilize for resistance. Um, and this is happening uh, as we speak. I think sweeping across the nation, there are marches going on uh, for women's rights to abortion. Um, and that's just, you know, as large as these demonstrations are, that's just one aspect of the struggle where we can show our power. And those are my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Thank you, Kay. Yes, thank you. I have a response. Go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a response. So, Kay, thank you very much on that. And I mean, clearly, you know, we as a party, uh, you know, really look at uh, fascism. And, you know, it's very clear that it can only, you know, gain effort or gain momentum when there is in inaction. And that is why we always mobilize a united front. We give power back to the people. We find ways in which to mobilize. We help our fellow workers to understand the power of democracy. Uh, whereas the bourgeoisie, as you had indicated, the trapping of what they do is they attempt to, they promote democracy to a certain extent, but they, they do it through monetizing it. Whereas we provide the tools, we help workers realize the power of democracy to promote the issues that are important to them, important to us. So clearly what we've been doing, and you know, uh, Joelle, myself, comrades over a hundred years, is we find ways to amplify our voice. We become the spark plugs within any type of group that's out there that we are a part of. We raise our voices, we bring in the issues and the mechanics on how to get things done. And we fight fascism by moving from inaction to action. And it can be as little as fighting for new school board members, new city council members. Those are the things that the party does. There are small baby steps, but that is how we move forward. We, we make action, we make things happen. Okay, thank you. Henry, did you want to say something, Joel? I just said, great, I'm sorry. Okay, Henry, your mic is open. Henry Lowen Lowendor, your mic is open. There you are. 
Over the course of many years, the majority of congressional Democrats has voted to increase military budgets over those proposed by both Republican and Democratic presidents. As a result, funding social pro programs promoted by the Democratic Party um, suffers greatly. So I have a two-part question. One, is there any evidence that voting for Democrats leads to a decrease in imperialist policies? That's the first. The second is, how do we practically link the struggle against fascism with the struggle against milita militarism, war, and imperialism? And importantly, how do we inject this linkage into the elections? Okay, let's take some more. Uh, comments or questions? Jonas, your mic is open. Jonas Cervantes, you, there you are. Thank you. Can you hear me? A little bit louder, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's pronounced Jonas. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Say that again. Uh, my name is pronounced Jonas. It's in Spanish. Jonas, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um, so, Similar to um, the question I was just asking, I, I was wondering, does does National recommend running our own candidates when we can, uh, as opposed to supporting like progressive candidates, or or like uh, rephrased, is there a preference between running our own Communist Party candidates for school board, uh, mayor, uh, sorry, think of my own county county commissioners, uh, as opposed to progressive Democrats or other uh, left leaning politicians? Looking for more raised hands. Thank you. Michael Madden, your mic is open. Michael Madden, your mic is open. And it's open on your end too. So, um, uh, thank you for seeing that the sign was up. I just have to say, D, what has been brought to bear in this Saturday event, uh, to me, is is a uh, phase shift. Everything that's been presented, starting out with your comments and Scott Hiley, is like the light has turned on, the clouds have been pushed away, and we see the way forward. So my observation is, this is you broke through and done this, D, and all of your colleagues. This is going to be the start of an ongoing um, educational process to go on social media, but also perhaps uh, paper wise to have in the clubs, because what you've really done here, Joe and and uh, the, the comrades from Connecticut is realize we're in a different time now and we need to be able to explain the facts of life in an elemental way, D, and you've done it. So my only comment is all power and keep going. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, the comrade from Connecticut is Joel Fishman. Thank you. All right, looking for, for raised hands. Michael, your mic is open. Um, hello, yes. I, I'm coming from Houston, Texas, and I voted in every major election the last 12 years, and I just wanted to give a comment. Uh, this year, when I voted in the primary, they had changed the voting machines, and they're much harder to use now. Uh, previously, the machines, you did everything at one machine, the machine was covered, no one could see your vote. That's different now. Now there are two machines, the coverings are gone, everyone can see your vote, you walk past, you see who you're voting for, and then you do your work at the first machine, and then there's a second machine you have to go to. And there's probably 10 of the first machines and only one of the second machines, which creates this giant bottleneck where everyone has to just line up to go to this one machine. So I guess my comment was going to be even the basic just practicality of putting in your vote in the machine itself is now really very frustrating and very inconvenient. So. I just wanted to comment because I'm I'm in Texas and that that's what that's one thing happening here. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Mushin, your your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. There you are. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to raise a slightly different issue. 
one of the things I have found out by talking to people is often they will say the communism is an alien idea. It is not something that out of the belongs to the United States of America. In that context, I think the idea of the of the Bill of Rights socialism I think I found very appealing, and it, it, it sort of relates to people who already know about the, about this country and the history, and it is much better. I have seen that. I don't know why we don't talk more about the idea of the, of the Bill of Rights socialism. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Looking for raised hands. Well, Dee, maybe we should take this group now. Okay. okay. Um, right. So, Joe, do you want to start? Would you like me to start? How, how should we do uh, this? You know what? Uh, I'll take one. How about you take the other? There was one about uh, militarization. Yes. On that. So, you know, I, I'll just give a few cents on that one. And then, Joel, you should jump in. So, you know, decreasing the military. I mean, this is something that the party has been part and partial of fighting uh, against military buildup, of funding of military. But going back in my early days in the 20s, we were, you know, fighting for a nuclear freeze. Uh, in the 1980s, we were mobilizing marches, participating in those which led to a treaty back in the 1980s. And then, of course, uh, in the early twos, uh, during the presidential election of 2000, we were promoting uh, a decrease in the military budget through different United Front groups across the country. So we've always been a part of that. But, you know, the history of how we were engaged how we participated and in which ways did we mobilize in our United Front effort. You know, we need to discuss that more, but we've always been a part of that throughout the country. You know, uh, from the 80s to the early twos, you know, there were a number of groups that I was a part of, uh, and they weren't even uh, part of the union uh, effort, which was another big area. So it does happen. We are part of it. It's significant um, rollbacks in military spending versus human needs spending. We've seen improvements on human needs spending. We've also seen improvements on the right to vote, uh, to unionize, um, things like that too. But it just has not been explained in a broad way. And that is something that we have to really work on. Joelle. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I, I've had similar experiences as you're describing. Of course, we understand that imperialism is a high stage of capitalism. So um, we also understand, for example, that racism is embedded in capitalism. Um, yes, we understand that we need to change the whole system, but uh, there is a there is a difference between the conditions that we live in now and what fascism would mean. And there is a difference even in the uh, threat of military, military usage, uh, even though, as I said uh, in opening, uh, that we, we don't agree uh, with those Democrats who have the contradiction in their um, vote and thinking, uh, supporting um, imperialist policies and at the same time fighting tooth and nail for worker rights, et cetera. So, uh, with that in mind, I think the thing that we can highlight and do, and it refers back to what Joe Henry was saying, is put our shoulder to the wheel on the issue of the military budget, as, the, as Henry asked in his question. Um, and I was very excited. I attended a uh, partner. Our New Haven People Center is a partner with the... Um, Poor People's Campaign March on Washington, June 18. And so I attended a, um, a Poor People Campaign national organizing call. Uh, and they, there's about 200 partner part organizations. And so they highlighted four at that particular meeting. And they asked them to talk about what they're doing. And one of the four is Code Pink. And of course, the Poor People's Campaign one of the four pillars is uh, the issue of militarism. And so 
this uh, opportunity has opened up here uh, in which there is organizing specifically around uh, the military budget and, and uh, uh, war economy. That's part of this poor people's campaign effort. So it's getting way beyond just the traditional peace organizations. And we know, well, I'm thinking about the Vietnam War, which Henry and I both um, were <laughs> knew about that at the same time. And, um, you know, it was quite some time before the realization uh, set in. And at that point, uh, sort of the dam broke and uh, we were able to uh, have success in getting the U.S. troops out of Vietnam. So it's not it's not something easy, but it takes way more than just a few um, a few um, well informed um, forces or organizations. And another thing that's happening is uh, that within uh, the a number of unions now, even in the AFL CIO, there's a new way of looking and thinking about military spending, and that has to do with coming out of the pandemic. Uh, and the need for uh, all kinds of um, huge spending um, uh, for uh, essential workers and for the community. Uh, so there are there are um, tools here or uh, something you can latch upon uh, to connect those together. And we have to have, I'll say, revolutionary patience. Uh, we have to, we can't give up and we have to keep broadening the uh, struggle. But I think that it would be folly uh, to say that it wouldn't matter if we had uh, fascism in the country or if we had the situation that we have today. Um, that would be uh, a, vastly, uh, a vastly different experience for the people in the world uh, in the country. In the, excuse me, for the people in our country and for the people of the world and part of our internationalism, our working class internationalism is to organize as, as strongly as we can to stop that uh, uh, constant increase in the military spending. So I agree, I, I agree with what I think the point that Henry was making. And uh, as communists, we, we are trying to figure out at this point, we're having discussions, um, how do we make a bigger contribution toward uplifting um, a uh, huge peace movement in our country. Okay, a few more? Yeah, were there a couple of other questions? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, somebody uh, asked about running our own candidates and supporting progressives. I'd like right. to talk about that for a second, if I could. Sure. Um, and actually, in the uh, I chair the Political Action Commission. Uh, Joe is part of the Political Action Commission of our party. And um, I believe it was last year we developed um, uh, a proposal to the National Committee, which was adopted, of a process for running communist candidates. Um, if, if a club or a district is interested in doing that, there's uh, things that we keep in mind. It has to be connected to local struggles, and it has to be collectively approached and and so on and that's available at cpusa.org um, so we are uh, very uh, much uh, interested in running our own candidates um, and at the same time uh, it's not a contradiction to support progressives and uh, to build that movement we're part of that movement and so I say we do both and I'll just put a put in a little comment the way how did I end up in the Political Action Commission of the Communist Party uh, when I was young and we had a different climate in the country? We we're still trying to come out of the McCarthy period and um, let people know not to be to to, to um, overcome some of the stereotypes of the Communist Party. I was very shy, but I somehow got uh, convinced to run. I ran for Congress five times and uh, mayor three times and we had the communist party on the ballot as a minor party in the third congressional district in connecticut um and that the purpose of that was to bust through 
some of the um, anti-communism that was still so thick at that time. And actually, our campaign, which we developed a slogan, it was called People Before Profits. And uh, eventually, uh, a progressive Democrat did win in the district, and he credited our campaign with helping to change the political climate. This is a different time right now. And, um, you know, our emphasis is on uh, coalition building, but we also have to have our presence as well. So I just thought that I would share that historical fact. Okay. Yeah, I want to, want to jump in there and also, you know, uh, highlight with what Joelle indicated. Joelle, I didn't realize that. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, having, uh, you know, in my 40 years, managed a number of uh, candidate campaigns from a city council to uh, to congressional. I can tell you that, uh, you know, it's, it's important to do. Uh, you have to, as Joel indicated, figure out on a ground level, uh, what's the best way of doing it? What are you amplifying? Are you building a coalition uh, to, to promote? Uh, what are the issues? Uh, those are all very important things. Sometimes uh, instead of doing it as a party candidate, you do it as a coalition candidate, but at the same time, it's clear to the coalition who you are, what your politics are, so that you can be the spark plug of ideas and, and movements and so forth and so on. So there's many ways to do it. Um, things that we can discuss, as Joel indicated, you know, uh, working with the National Party on how to get your feet off the ground, how to build that coalition, and how to understand how to mobilize the vote. Uh, that's very important. Some of us started doing that 40 years ago. We learned through, you know, getting uh, voter, voting information, finding out who was registered to vote, how to reach out to them, knocking on doors. All those things are very important. You can't, you can't go to the mountaintop unless you start at the bottom. You really have to work your way up. So I would encourage anyone who wants to get involved in in moving towards candidate elections to work in the grassroots, to become engaged in be it Democratic Party politics or non-party politics, very, very important. Okay, a few more. Do you want a few more or do you want to end? <laughs> well, if there aren't more, I think it's been... There, a there, are, a couple, there are two more. Well, let's oh. take two more. Is that all right, Joe? Yeah, we got time. I'll make some more coffee. <laughs> okay, Shay, your mic is open. Shay, your mic is open. Yeah, um, I really like this talk. Um, uh, Dimitrios Against Fascism War is a really great book. One, uh, a companion book I think is really good is um, A Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein because it described how the speed of events uh, is important to like shock the populace for them to allow their political uh, agenda to pass. Like if you examine just this month, we've gone from tens of billions to Ukraine to Roe versus Wade's gonna get overturned to now we aren't gonna feed infants anymore. Like it's the the pace of deterioration is, is so fast. And I think it does a number on people psychologically that makes it difficult to, to, to help get them to do action. Thank you. And one more. Yamid, your mic is open. Yamid. Hello, I just have uh, one question to ask, which is how exactly does one vote against fascism? I think as we see the far right uh, progressively mobilize, uh, one of the most important features of it is that they're armed. And not only are they armed, but they're protected by the state. Um, I, like we, as we saw last year with the Rittenhouse or how much of that was this year, or uh, in the case of the police, you know, I've lost family to the police. And it's not like, uh, the, I, I feel like fascism and uh, the state going hand in hand, how do one vote against that? You know, I don't under, I like, uh, an earnest question is how exactly does voting stop a bullet when we progressively are hitting a more and more intense 
um, situation in America right now. Okay, I'm going to turn the floor back over to uh, Joelle and Joe, and you can respond to uh, the questions and comments as you choose, and you can make your summary remarks. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Joe, Joe, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll be really quick here. I mean, uh, the, the quickly changing environment out there has indicated uh, a lack of action on behalf of a number of different groups over a period of time where we as comrades can really help change that and put things into motion. You know, fighting fascism, fascism only uh, exists during periods of inaction and really mobilizing in the different groups that we're a part of is just so very, very important on that. Uh, we, can, we can deal with this and we have dealt with this. Uh, we have not forgotten what happened in 2020 when people hit the streets uh, to fight for justice uh, for people who were persecuted by police. M mass mobilization, very important. It changed things in uh, just a, in a quick couple of weeks with the mobilization that continued on through the summer months. Uh, we must remind people how important that is, and also voter engagement, because in many areas apart, uh, across the country, that mobilization was somewhat decentralized, but in other ways it was centralized. And it did lead to voter engagement and to changing legislation. That was a power that we must continue to discuss on how that happens. That would, uh, had that not happened, uh, I can only imagine how the presidential election would have turned out. But people were enlightened, engaged. Uh, the people who started the movement were spark plugs for change. They made things happen. Uh, the party clearly played a part in that along with other United Front groups. So, uh, you know, Dimitri speaks about the inaction of groups and the, uh, the unwillingness of uh, social democratic party groups to to not uh, create unity amongst different coalitions, how they just basically sat on their laurels. Uh, same thing now. Uh, we have to engage, we have to be part of those groups that can mobilize anywhere from the Democratic Party to uh, women's groups, uh, diverse groups, union groups, wherever we're a part of, we have to mobilize and do that. And, you know, the growth of the party over the last couple of years has been tremendous, tremendous, and it's really incumbent upon us to really help uh, the new comrades become spark plugs. Joelle? Thank you, Joe. Yeah, how do we vote against fascism? And um, I'll start with a little story because I ended up talking about uh, the contribution of Art Perla, who's my husband. Um, and he was elected as the uh, ward co-chair here where we live in New Haven. So uh, what, what, um, what he led as a vote against fascism in 2020 was an intensive voter um, education and registration drive of house to house throughout the ward. Um, a big, a big um, committee that was engaged and involved together. Um, and that has stayed, that has, that has um, um, created new leaders out of, uh, out of that uh, uh, effort uh, to defeat Trump, to dump Trump. Um, we've been talking, uh, I think not only in this session, but I tried to attend most of the classes. And this concept of a broad united front hasn't just been um, posed here. So when you think of this broad united front now, imagine uh, in, I think it's Pennsylvania, in some of the states where the Republicans have had their primaries, uh, not their primaries, their uh, conventions, and they've chosen people to run who were actually there and part of the coup attempt on January 6th, who were running for Secretary of State, for Governor, and for um, attorney general, all right. And then imagine 
that the uh, opposing candidate, who happens to be a Democrat, is standing up for the right to vote and expansion of voting, voting rights and holding accountable those who are uh, part of that coup. So that's how you would vote against fascism. First of all, you would get people engaged in your community. Um, you would look at the issues and make sure that the fascist-minded candidates um, are resoundingly defeated. Um, you take the example of Roe v. Wade. There are candidates, Republican candidates, being nominated by their party who not only are happy if, if the Supreme Court does away with Roe v. Wade, but would like to have a national law in the whole country that would outlaw abortion rights in every state versus a candidate who says, I uphold the right of a woman's uh, reproductive and health rights. So that is a clear, to me, um, a choice and a way to vote against fascism. So it's building an ongoing movement. This is not a this is not a one election story that we're talking about. It's building an ongoing movement as as Joe has um, presented so uh, carefully. Um, and um, so I would say, uh, not so much in terms of the the um, question that was asked, but just in general. I would say, don't believe the hype that the media is just pummeling upon us as if Trump and the Republicans have already won, as if they already have the majority, uh, and that there is nothing that we can do. Don't believe the hype because it doesn't have to be that way. If we can out organize and uh, on the basis of the, the issues, on the basis of a woman's right to choose, on the basis of the right to vote, one person, one vote, uh, on the basis of ending hunger and homelessness and moving money out of the military budget. We may not win it in that session, but we, we have to continue to build up the ranks of those who support it. So, um, and how does, how does a vote against fascism connect to building the party. Among working class people, when we work like that and when we work with others, there's a lot of respect. There's a lot of respect because people say, wow, I wanted to find out how I could make a difference. And I see that by joining the Communist Party, that's how I can make a difference now. And that's how we can get rid of this horrible capitalist system. This, this brutal capitalist system and change it to something that's humane and, uh, and run by the people. So that's my comment. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Joelle Fishman and Joe Henry and Waleed for helping us uh, with this class and the little contribution that Kay uh, offered uh, as well. Thank you everyone for participating in the National School. This is the last class for this series. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to uh, doing more. If you are interested in helping us with Marxist education, please send me an email at d, d -E -E at cpusa.org. We need more help in, in, in uh, pulling together uh, classes, uh, so your help will enable us to do more. If you're interested in helping, please email me at dee -E at cpusa.org. This is just, uh, uh, it's not a beginning, but it's a continuation of the process of doing our job, which is providing a Marxist framework to our working class so that we can have the tools that we need in order to fight back and win victory. Thank you again. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon. Thank you. And Enjoy thank you.
Enjoy the rest of your weekend, everyone. Thank you for participating. Good afternoon.